today or um, if you'd like to see it again, we are recording and we will have this available um, for everybody on our website within the next few days. Um, we will be answering questions at the end of Sandra's reading. So if you or your little one would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function on the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. You can ask a question at any time during the presentation, but they won't be answered until, until the end of the reading. Um, as some of you have commented, you are not able to unmute yourself or be on camera. We are in a webinar um, set up today. So any communication, if you have a question, again, please use the chat function or the, or the Q&A box to, to communicate, and I'm happy to answer questions as we go through. Um, so Marjorie Stoneman Douglas did not intend to write about the Everglades, but when she returned to Florida from World War I, she hardly recognized the place that was her home. The Florida that Marjorie knew was rapidly disappearing, with the rare orchids, magnificent birds, and massive trees disappearing with it. Marjorie couldn't sit back and watch her home be destroyed. She had to do something. And thanks to Marjorie, a part of the Everglades became a national park and the first park not created for sightseeing, but for the benefit of animals and plants. Without Marjorie, the part of her home that she loved so much would have been destroyed instead of the protective wild, protected wildlife preserve it has become today. Here to tell the story of how Marjorie saved the Everglades is author Sandra Neal Wallace. Sandra is an award-winning author of books for young readers. Known for her investigative journalism and original narrative style, she writes stories about people who break barriers and change the world. Her titles have won NCTE's Orbis Pictus Award for Outstanding Nonfiction, SCBWI's Golden Kite Honor Award, and been selected as ALA Notable Books, the Chicago Li Public Library's Best of the Best, Booklist Editor Choice, Bank Street College's Best Children's Book of the Year, and earned YAL Essays Award nomination for excellence in nonfiction. Before becoming an author, Sandra was a network news anchor and ESPN sportscaster. She broke a gender barrier in sports by becoming the first woman to anchor an NHL broadcast on national TV. Excuse me. She lives in New Hampshire and Maine with her husband and frequent book collaborator, author Rich Wallace. We are thrilled that she's able to be here today to spend time with us to share Marjorie's story. It is my very great pleasure to have her back with us for another Brave Girls Virtual Storytime presentation. Please welcome Sandra Neal Wallace. Oh, thank you. I am so thrilled to be back, Liz. I wanna thank you and I wanna thank the National Women's History Museum for inviting me to be here today as part of awesome Brave Girls Virtual Storytime. It is such an honor to read aloud Marjorie Saves the Everglades. It's so lyrical. I always love revisiting Rebecca Gibbons' illustrations. And I'm really looking forward to answering all of your questions following the read aloud. And I especially love that we are honoring Marjorie Stoneman Douglas today, a hidden hero in STEM and environmental history during Earth Month, and especially today on April 7th, which is Marjorie's birthday. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. I'm going to get right into the read aloud um, uh, because it's uh, a robust book and I want you to share immediately and enjoy the illustrations of Rebecca. So the picture book biography is entitled Marjorie Saves the Everglades, the story of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, written by me, Sandra Neal Wallace, and beautifully illustrated by Rebecca Gibbon. And I start the book with a quote from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. We're so lucky that she wrote an autobiography and so many articles that I could reference her voice and put her voice in the book. And it starts with what she says. It stretches as it always has stretched in one thick, enormous curving river of grass to the very end. This is the Everglades said Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Before airplanes and automobiles, a girl in gold rim glasses sailed on a steamboat to Florida. In a grove ripe with dimpled fruit, she bit into an orange, sweet and sticky. Far from home and safe in her father's arms, Young Marjorie Stoneman shared his hazel eyes and a thirst for the tropical light. Now a seed was planted for her love of Florida, but it would be a long time before Marjorie felt the Southern sunlight again. 
for her father's warm hug. After the trip, she trekked to Taunton with her mother, back to apple trees and snow. They lived with her grandparents and Aunt Fanny in a house with an attic window. They see the stars. When the grown-ups talk, 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 Marjorie climbed quietly into the attic and read, read, read. Books became her best friends. So did the outdoors. In the winter, she hopped on her red bicycle and rode into the forest to find a Christmas tree. I read a lot of things I didn't understand, but that didn't stop me, she said. In springtime, she watched herring flip-flopping in the Taunton River. Slow and steady at first, then whoosh, like a tidal wave, flapping against the current to lay their eggs. When Marjorie turned 18, she zoomed to Wellesley College. She wrote to mother and Aunt Fanny about the mighty oak trees turning scarlet, but she never forgot the seed that had been planted when she was a child. As more seasons passed, 24-year-old Marjorie married, but the union failed. She kept the Douglas name and boarded a train, leaving her old life behind. Heading south, the train twisted and turned through forests of pine. While Marjorie slept, it chug-chugged toward palm trees. By morning, a tropical light, familiar and bright, woke her up. Marjorie's heart beat faster as the train screeched to a stop. She'd arrived at her destination, Miami, Florida. A kind man with graying hair hopped aboard and strode toward her. Hello, father, she said. And just like that, after 19 years of never seeing him, Marjorie hugged her father. There we were, reunited with no fuss and feathers, she said. Marjorie's father had started the Miami Herald newspaper. He asked her to be a reporter. She couldn't wait to begin. Two or three reporters is all we had. I was the only woman, she said. Finally, she found her voice. It wasn't her father's voice, her mother's voice, or Aunt Fanny's. It was entirely the voice of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. She wrote about schools of mullet leaping over Biscayne Bay, sandy streets shimmering like moonlight on snow, and how women should have the right to vote, the same as men. In 1917, with World War I raging in Europe, Marjorie longed to write about the women joining the war effort, but no woman from Florida had enlisted in the Navy, so Marjorie did. I wanted my own life in my own way, she said. Soon she joined the Red Cross and sailed for Europe. She wrote about refugees living in caves. They'd lost their homes because of the war. Marjorie gave them what comfort she could, warm pajamas, and powdered milk. When the war ended, she returned to Florida, but hardly recognized it. Workers dynamited, dug, and drained waterways to build, build, build. Trains, boats, automobiles arrived jammed with people, she said. Developers saw the soggy muck of the Everglades as useless swampland. Drain the Everglades, they insisted. Speculators snapped up land by the gallon. Marjorie didn't want the old Florida she knew to disappear, so she decided to write about it. She studied its rare birds. She searched for secluded beaches, swimming under the moonlight. She putt-putted along Florida's new highway with her friends right to the edge of the Everglades. They fished for breakfast and cooked it on a fire. Munching on garfish, Marjorie watched the sunrise, giant and orange, and flamingo pink. 
The grass in the islands of the hardwoods stood alone in the light and the beautiful air. But at 40 years old, Marjorie had never been inside the Everglades until she met gardener Ernest Poe. Poe believed that the Everglades had to be preserved before they disappeared forever. He read how much Marjorie knew about the birds and the fish. Would she go on a trip to help him convince park officials to make the Everglades a national park? Marjorie couldn't wait to go, but having never lived outdoors, she packed for a party instead of a camping trip. Traveling by houseboat, Marjorie meandered through the glades in a string of pearls and a silk dress with pleats as thick as the sawgrass jutting through the shallow waters. She spotted crocodiles swimming, alligators soaking up the sun, and the wiry roots of ghost orchids wrapped around the trunks of pond apples. She saw sea turtles, round as rain barrels, bobbing through forests of gumbo limbo. Soon, Marjorie was covered in mosquito bites. She didn't care. She'd fallen in love with the Everglades. The people from the National Park Service felt differently. A swamp is a swamp, they complained, swatting at mosquitoes. Where were the mountains, the canyons, and the rushing waterfalls? Who would ever visit the bug-infested Everglades? At night, as manatees slept near the houseboat, hunters sailed silently by, hoisting fiery torches. They headed for the rookeries, snatch egrets and sell their feathers for women's hats. Marjorie knew that the Everglades had to become a national park to save the birds, the plants, and the other wildlife. But without majestic mountains and bug-free canyons, how would she persuade park officials to love Florida's birds the way she did and to protect them? What if they could somehow fly with the birds? That was the answer. Riding in the sky in a giant balloon. Up, up the dirigible rose with Marjorie and the group in it, floating above the Everglades. Below them, the shallow waters gleamed amber, curling through green and yellow prairies and sand hills of Sisyphus coiling around tree island of red and black mangroves, arching across South Florida like the tentacles of a giant squid. It was all so beautiful and unique. For once, Marjorie had no words to describe it. Marjorie and the others floated, free as birds, while the throaty sounds of fire plumes Puff puffed to keep them aloft. In the late afternoon, the sounds of birds flying home drowned out the thrum thrumming of the engine's flames. The sky became feathers. Woodstorks circled. Egrets and ibis swooped and dived. Marjorie recognized all of them. 10, 20, 30,000 birds cast shadows against the pink sky. The park officials had never seen so many birds in one place. By the time the sun had set, they'd forgotten about canyons and mountains. Marjorie, Ernest Coe, and the birds had convinced them to make the Everglades a national park. The ride in the sky stayed with Marjorie long after her mosquito bites had healed. She built a curious cottage, perfect for one person, plus several cats. She painted the walls flamingo pink. Under its roof, which coiled and curled like the Everglades waters, Marjorie studied her house cats and thought of the Florida panther. 
Were the Everglades really a swamp? Marjorie didn't think so. How could a place where flamingos walk and thatch palms thrive be swampland? The water stood still. Marjorie had to find out. But in 1940s, there wasn't much scientific research on how the Everglades worked. Marjorie asked geologists and anthropologists mountains of questions. She examined the Everglades muck, wearing a hat made of straw, never feathers. She learned about limestone sandcastles tunneling below the mud. 57-year-old Marjorie dug deep deep into her research and made a monumental discovery. The Everglades weren't a swamp at all, but a river, a slow-moving, life-giving river of grass. With those three words, I changed everybody's knowledge, she said. Fresh water into salt water, fine lands into lowlands, from the Kissimmee River into Lake Okeechobee, the Everglades teemed with life. It supported so many kinds of life that it formed its own ecosystem, an ecosystem kept alive by water that Floridians depended on. There are no other Everglades in the world, she said. Though Marjorie wasn't a scientist, she made bold scientific discoveries. Using her voice for good, she wrote about them in a book called The Everglades, River of Grass. With language so lovely and logical, Marjorie changed people's minds about the Everglades. For the first time, they knew why the Everglades mattered. Wherever fresh water runs and the sawgrass starts up, that's where you have the Everglades, she said. But the mighty builders from the U.S. Army had different plans for the Everglades. They straightened the natural curves of the Kissimmee River to control its water. The ancient river became a canal. They called it C-38. Lake Okeechobee became polluted. Birds died. The Everglades began to dry up. Marjorie was heartbroken. The Everglades were dying, she said. And now there were plans to build a gigantic airport, a jet port, right in the middle of the Everglades, cementing curves where water flowed and crocodiles and alligators swam. Marjorie's friend, Joe Browder, was trying to stop the jet port. He knocked on the door of her curious cottage and asked for help. But I'm just one person, she replied. No one would pay any attention to me. Joe drove Marjorie to the jet port site. One runway had already been built. By now, Marjorie's eyesight had grown weak, and the stronger, bigger glasses she wore didn't help much. As she walked toward the runway, shafts of brilliant tropical light caught the corners of Marjorie's eyes where she could still see. She walked in this glow until a giant fence with a great big sign stopped her. The world's first all new jet port for the supersonic age, it read. Marjorie knew that supersonic meant the end of the Everglades. She had to find a way to stop it. People only listen to organizations, she whispered to Joe. Why don't you start an organization, he asked. Marjorie was almost 80 years old. She was nearly deaf and blind. But making a difference had nothing to do with those things. At that moment, as Ibis flew above her, their wings flapping like the sound of a thousand silken ribbons, and raindrops tat a tat tapped on her straw hat, Marjorie became an activist. Every time it rained, we know the Everglades are there, she said. 
she started Friends of the Everglades. Marjorie and her Everglades friends rode around Lake Okeechobee in an old camper. Motoring from town to town, Marjorie told the residents why the jet port must be stopped and how important the Everglades were to Florida. No matter how poor my eyes are, I can still talk, Marjorie said. 300 people became friends of the Everglades, then 60,000 children and grown-ups, anyone could join for a dollar. Be a nuisance, Marjorie urged her Everglades friends. Never give up. The jet port builders didn't take Marjorie seriously. They joked that they'd give earmuffs to the alligators so the jumbo jets wouldn't disturb them. We're going to build the jet port, they warned Marjorie, whether you like it or not. But the governor of Florida and the president of the United States took Marjorie very seriously. They poured over a study that found what Marjorie already knew. The jet port would destroy the Everglades. Marjorie and the study convinced the president that the jet port was a bad idea and the jet port was stopped. As the years passed, people forgot about the jet port. Sugarcane farmers reclaimed the Everglades water for their crops. Land developers drained more Everglades muck to build new towns. Most of all, they wanted Marjorie to stop talking about saving the Everglades and its water. People must come to realize that it's all the same water from the Kissimmee to Okeechobee to the Everglades, she said. 93-year-old Marjorie refused to be silenced. As mosquitoes buzzed and bit at town meetings, she spoke her mind. Go home, granny, people yelled and hissed. Butterfly chaser, they booed. Can't you boo any louder than that, Marjorie demanded. I'm gone all night, and I'm used to the heat. Whenever Marjorie spoke, she spoke the truth, no matter how unpopular her words were. If the Everglades go, then South Florida becomes a desert, Marjorie explained. What Marjorie wanted for the Everglades was radical, enormous, and monumental. It was something that only Marjorie dared to dream. What the Everglades needed, Marjorie knew, was to be made whole again. The Everglades is a test. If we pass it, we get to keep the planet, she said. After nearly 100 years of dredging, draining and polluting, Marjorie convinced the government to restore the Everglades. They worked to put the Everglades back to the way they found it. It became the largest restoration project in American history. Engineers tore up the canals they had built. They filled in the ditches and gave the Everglades back its curves. Soon, water meandered through South Florida. Sawgrass became submerged. The birds came back, ibis and egrets and wood storks. So did the sea turtles, the crocs and the alligators. Returning the Everglades to what it was always meant to be, a river of grass. One person had made a difference, slow and steady at first, then whoosh, just like a tidal wave. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas saved the Everglades. So I want to thank you so much for listening to me read this picture book biography. As you can see, there's an author's note and there's some incredible illustrations of some of the more than 70 endangered and threatened species that call the Everglades home and are able to survive because
Eastern's and Everglades National Park. Probably the most endangered right now is still the Florida panther. But there are other species that are still endangered, including the leatherback sea turtle and even plants like the green thatch palm, the Florida scrub zisyphus, and the ghost orchid, which can take 16 years to bloom and smells like so. So I just love these illustrations by Rebecca Gibbon, and I know that she is celebrating and honoring Marjorie Stoneman Douglas's birthday today. Marjorie would have been 131 years old today. And you know, many people plant trees in her honor or take a pledge to protect wildlife that is endangered. What I like to do is make Marjorie a carrot cake. And my version of a carrot cake is carrot candles, a rice cake, some peanut butter, and some apple slices. So I wanna sing a quick happy birthday to Marjorie. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Marjorie. Happy birthday to you. And I'm so grateful for Marjorie's more than 80 years of persistent ways and years of protecting the Everglades. So I'm looking forward to your questions and talking more about perhaps the creation of the book. Um, it's a great and perfect day to talk about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and the Everglades. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I know before the program started, you and I had been chatting a little bit about the illustrations and the process with this book and with Rebecca, who was the illustrator. Can you tell us a little bit about how this kind of all came to be? Yeah, I would love to. Um, a little bit of some insider's knowledge, um, sneak peek of what it's like to be um, an author of a picture book. I usually you don't have contact or communication with the illustrator if you aren't the author illustrator. That's usually up to um, the publisher and the designer and the um, um, uh, illustrator connector of the book. But you know that I love to break barriers, Liz. So I'm always connecting and wanting to connect um, with the illustrators because I feel that it not only makes for a richer experience, it we're both collaborators on the book, but if there's any questions, any information, any in-depth research that I can share with the illustrator, um, just makes everything more concise and um, more accurate. So uh, Rebecca lives in England, and when I spoke to my editor, Paula Wiseman, um, this book is uh, an imprint of Paula Wiseman book, and Paula is amazing to work with. Um, I, I said I have lots of photo research and images of Marjorie that I would love to share and answer any questions that Rebecca has. So we immediately connected. I think I sent her about 60 photographs. I really wanted her to be able to know what Marjorie looked like at every stage of her life and also the evolution of the eyeglasses. If you notice um, in the illustrations from the gold rim glasses that Marjorie had as a young child to the, to the 70s um, glasses and then the thicker, thicker rims. And usually when we see Marjorie, not a lot of people know who Marjorie Stoneman Douglas is, but Floridians certainly do. And I know that when I read books about Marjorie, I only saw images of her when she was in her 90s and in her 100s when she was a centenarian. She lived to be 108. Mm -hmm. um, so I was really curious about uh, when her um, persistence and her energy and her love for the Everglades and her voice began. So it was really interesting to find photos of her as a child um, and as a, as a woman reporter in her 20s. Um, and just what she experienced, can you imagine when Marjorie came to um, Florida, women didn't have the right to vote. Uh, as a matter of fact, she became a suffragist. She went to the Florida legislature, Liz, and demanded that women have the right to vote. Of course, the politicians were all men and they didn't take her seriously. I think there's a recurring theme of Marjorie not being taken seriously first as a woman and then as an older woman, so experiencing gender discrimination and ageism. And she just 
was nonplussed and did not let that stop her. But getting back to the Rebecca Gibbon illustrations, if you go back to some of the illustrations, it's really fun to, to do, and you notice some of the turtles or you notice some of the birds and you think, oh, maybe there's three, four, five, six, seven species on a page. When I spoke with Rebecca, she said, you know, I have sometimes 70 and 80 um, different species that I've incorporated on the pages. And her very favorite um, illustration is a two-page spread with um, Marjorie being covered in mosquito bites. She told me that that was one of her favorite um, joyful um, illustrations to do. I love what you have right there, which are all the different the different birds. I think that's really, really incredible. Um, and I also love this particular um, illustration that you can see when it's um, the manatees, you can see all the, um, the different underwater um, wildlife. You're getting close to there it. Yes, right there. <laughs> but if you identify and look at all the different uh, species and creatures that are there, it's such a rich um, demonstration of the, the vast number of species that call um, the Everglades home in this incredible ecosystem. Um, and I just love the fact that uh, Rebecca was able to incorporate uh, that in the photo and just with her own unique style yeah. um, and with the coloration. I know that uh, we're lucky that this book has won several awards and, um, and is a finalist for the Green Earth Book Award. We'll find out if it wins on Earth Day. But um, all of the, um, the National Science uh, Teaching Association, it's a uh, the um, Honor California Book Award that just say that the illustrations really draw you in and um, really imbibe Marjorie's energy that she had um, in every stage of her life. So uh, it was really exciting and an honor to work with Rebecca. And I hope we work on books in the future. She said that she has a new role, role model and that definitely is Marjorie and, and I do too. So thank you for asking about yep. that collaboration. It's really exciting. Um, so we actually, it looks like we have a few classes who have joined us. And so, oh, fantastic. Um, so a lot it. of these questions are coming from the students who, um, so the questions are being submitted by their teacher. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through some of these questions that, that we have. Yeah. Um, so Tommy from Miss Erickson's class is asking, what inspired you to make this book? And then I'm just going to follow that up with a, with a question from Henry, who's asking, what inspired you to become an author? So kind of all, all <laughs> included in that question. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, I'm, I'm quickly going to touch upon and great questions. Thank you so much, Tommy and Heather. Um, well, as you, uh, I'm not sure if you knew, if you were in for the, for the beginning of that, that Liz had mentioned that I became a barrier breaker myself as the first woman to host um, an NHL broadcast, a hockey broadcast on national television. So um, I love talking about uh, movers and shakers and what I call glass ceiling breakers, um, because I find that we have a lot in common and it's not necessarily that we're doing something to be the first. We're, I wanted to cover the NHL because I knew I belonged there and I wasn't going to let the fact that um, I didn't look like all the reporters who were there because they were men and I was a woman stop me. So um, when I spent 15 years as a news anchor and a sports anchor, which I loved, a lot of times I was the one that was courtside or ringside interviewing people like Shaquille O'Neal or Wayne Gretzky. And those were what we called, you know, those 30 second sound bites. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted the opportunity to write long books and to spend years if I wanted to doing research. Mm -hmm. So it was so exciting for me to be able to always be a storyteller, transfer from television to writing books just for you. Mm -hmm. And the change makers and the barrier breakers that I focus on, people like Marjorie, are people that you usually have no idea who they are. Mm -hmm. They're what I call hidden heroes in history, but that you should know about them. And likely the reason why you don't know about them is because they face discrimination. There are so many women change makers who are just now coming to light 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years later, right, Liz? Mm -hmm. who, who really should have been known um, 
decades before or in the time that they made a difference, um, but they faced so many obstacles. So it's such a joy for me to introduce them to you and your generation because you're going to grow up knowing about them and making sure that you honor um, the change makers who are making a difference now and not having any discrimination towards them. So it was what I usually try and do and pick out too, which I think is important, is that if the change maker that I'm focused on has done a lot of writing or maybe wrote a book about themselves, an autobiography or a memoir, I want to incorporate their voice in the, um, the text so that you know, and I think you can really feel that hopefully with Marjorie in this book, what they sound like and what they were thinking in different stages of their life. Mm -hmm. So great question, thank you. Um, and we have a, a few different questions here about um, really how you became interested in Marjorie's story um, and what inspired you to tell this particular story about Marjorie and her efforts to save the, the Everglades. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Well, firstly, of course, because outside of Florida, people don't know who Marjorie Stoneman Douglas is and her accomplishments. Um, that's really the big thing, number one. I mean, can you imagine, this is, this is a story of one person making a difference who isn't famous, who isn't a politician, who didn't necessarily, as Liz said in the beginning of our presentation, start out to be an activist or to save the Everglades, but really um, couldn't stand another day, another moment without fighting for something that she believed in. And she really had the foresight and saw when she came back from serving as a Red Cross um, helper, with um, alongside nurses um, in Europe, that the um, exploitation of land, that the development was happening so fast, that waterways were being cemented in, that birds were disappearing, that I need to do something about it. So I find it incredible that in an age where women were suppressed in the 1920s and 30s, there's someone like Ernest Poe, who was a conservationist and read Marjorie's column, said, Come with me, help me convince the national parks officials, you're a great writer, you love the Florida Everglades, help me convince them that the Everglades matters. Mm -hmm. And as she started to dig deeper, she realized that not only does the Everglades matter as a unique ecosystem, that it provides water, it's the water system for so many Floridians. I think um, more than half of Floridians get their water source from um, the waters, the aquifers that are living in the Everglades. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about Marjorie saving the Everglades, um, environmental historians really do say that if it wasn't for Marjorie, if she didn't help make it a national part of the Everglades a national park, if she didn't stop that jet port, which would have been five or six times bigger than the JFK airport, oh, wow. that there wouldn't have been an Everglades that could be saved. Mm -hmm. But of course, every generation, the Everglades become more vulnerable because people forget. People forget um, what happened and the importance of the Everglades. So young people like you, it's so important for you to know why the Everglades is important. Mm -hmm. And you can join Friends of the Everglades. There's a young Friends of the Everglades and you can take the pledge to honor the planet and to honor um, the species uh, that are endangered in the Everglades and in your area. You can go to friendsoftheeverglades.org and become a young Friends of the Everglades. Oh, that's that's great advice. Um, in fact, I'm going to, I will put that in the chat um, for everybody. And if you could say that one more time. Yeah, if you go to friendsoftheeverglades.org, which Marjorie started in 1969. Remember, I talked about her driving around in an old camper and she had two or three, four followers, and I, now there's tens of thousands. So when you go on that site, you can join Young Friends of the Everglades and you can take a pledge to be a planet protector. And there are very specific ways um, that it shows you how to do that, um, which is really exciting. And on another note, since we have so many classes, if you want to go to my website, SandraNeilWallace.com, um, I created, had educators create activity kits, and I had them create educators' guides that are common for a line that would be great units to pair with if you're talking about ecosystems, but also talking about women change makers. The first that Marjorie created and how we're all connected, right? We don't really sort of live in a 
vacuum or I know we're living in a bubble right now, but everything we do tends to affect other areas in our life and people's lives. So when she found out about women not having the right to vote, she became a suffragist. And then when she found out that there weren't any women in the Naval Reserve from Florida, she joined that. And then when she found out that the Everglades needed saving after she wrote the rivers of, River of Brass, she founded her own nonprofit. So it just shows you how one person can make a difference. And she really gives us a blueprint how, don't you think, Liz? It's really incredible Absolutely. throughout the years, the different ways that she created change. Yeah. Um, so we have time for one final question. And I and I always love to kind of end on a on a question that really makes us think. Um, so our, our final question is Marjorie faced both gender and age discrimination. That was something that you yourself brought up at the beginning of um, the Q&A session. What would you say to young girls or not even young girls, but our younger generation about what they can achieve now and in the future as well? Oh, there's, there's so much you can achieve. And what's so great is that you, there are so many role models that you can tap in to have support. You know, Marjorie didn't really have a lot of support or role models. I didn't really have a lot of role models in women's sports. So I would say um, lean in and, um, you know, take advantage of um, the fact that you can learn and glean and you can actually connect with women change makers on Zoom. There's some of the people that I write about, or you can actually talk to um, you know, members of Friends of the Everglades and really get advice in terms of you know, what to, how to move forward on something that you're passionate about. You have so many more tools today that you can utilize than I did, than Marjorie did. So this is a really, really exciting time. I think there's almost not a day or a week or a month, right, Liz, that goes by where we have gender barriers that are being broken. And it's just so exciting. And it's all these incremental steps. People like Marjorie, people like me, pave that one cement stone or that brick and mortar that you can actually climb up on. And you can do the same moving forward. It's just an exciting time to be a woman right now. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Sandra, so much for being back with us today and sharing Marjorie's story with us. Just a reminder for everybody, if you came in late, I've had a few questions. Yes, this presentation today is being recorded. It will be available on the National Women's History Museum's website sometime within the next few days, so please continue to check. Um, if you enjoyed today's program, Please join us in the coming weeks for more Brave Girls virtual story time readings. On Wednesday, April 21st, author Audrey Vernick will be with us to read her book, She Loved Baseball, The F and Manly Story. And on May 12th, um, we have another book um, called Love Is, and that's May 12th. Both events are at noon Eastern time. They are free to attend. Advanced registration for all NWHM programs is required. Um, you can find registration information again on womenshistory.org. Um, but thank you again so very much for sharing your time with us this afternoon, reading the story, and for all of your wonderful insights. Thank you to all of the attendees for your wonderful questions, and we hope that you all have a wonderful afternoon and a safe and healthy um, spring. So thank you again, Sandra, so much. Thank you to all of you who are attending, and we hope to see you again soon. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Liz, for shining a spotlight on Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, a hidden figure in STEM and environmental history. Bye for now.